In one of his essays, C.S. Lewis, author of The Chronicles of Narnia, wrote, A cow cannot be very good or very bad. A dog can be both better and worse. A child, better and worse still. An ordinary man, still more so. A man of genius, still more. Paladins represent the best of us. Their alignment locked to the straight and narrow path of lawful good. They wage an endless war against evil. Eternally sentinel against new threats to those under their protection. Paladins stand so high, which means that when they fall, they become truly terrible. The anti-paladin is the inverse, relentless in their pursuit of ruin, uncompromising in their cruelty, pitiless in their execution, and a powerful DPS that will wreak havoc at your next Pathfinder tabletop adventure. But before we look at the Anti-Paladin class, if you're in need of a Pathfinder 1E adventure path, have a look at Sorceress the Dietrich House. Designed for a party of four level 3 characters, this adventure has sinister mysteries, unsolved crimes, and a haunted house with lurking terrors to challenge your players. As well as unexpected treasures courtesy of the dynamic and thematic loot system, which makes for unique and compelling rewards for those willing to brave the depths of the Dietrich House. Available right now on DriveThruRPG. Alright, let's look at the Anti-Paladin. Anti-Paladins are alignment locked to chaotic evil. You have a d10 hit die, so you'll have a large health pool, as well as a base attack bonus equal to your level, which puts the Anti-Paladin in the same class as fighters, barbarians, and, well, paladins. Now, let's go over your ability scores. Strength is very important for an anti-paladin. It's the source of your damage. And as a DPS, it's what you live for. Dexterity will affect your AC and some skills, so it's of moderate importance. Constitution affects your HP and is also of moderate importance. Your intelligence and wisdom are low priorities. They affect your skills and your saving throws. Finally, charisma is very, very important to you. It impacts so many of your class features and is critical to your success as an anti-paladin. Now that you have a grasp on your relevant ability scores, let's talk about your race options. First, the good old Swiss Army knife of races, human. Like any battle-ready martial class, anti-paladins get a lot of mileage out of their feats. So, the human extra feat is a great feature to have. Also, that plus two bonus to any ability score can really fill in in an area that you need it. Now, if you're contemplating a dex-based anti-paladin, it is possible. I would highly recommend you look at the drow. They have an excellent favored class bonus for anti-paladin. Every four levels, a drow anti-paladin gets a new cruelty which is a feature of the Anti-Paladin's Lay on Hands equivalent. Another race worthy of your consideration are Half-Orcs. They have great racial features for Anti-Paladin, like Intimidating and Orcish Ferocity, which will allow you to get even more mileage out of Anti-Paladin class features and keep fighting even if you're going down in the middle of a battle. Also, how could I not mention Tiefling, specifically the Demon Variant. It's a stereotype for a reason. A demon variant tiefling gives you so many things you want. You get plus two to strength, plus two to charisma, and a minus two to intelligence, so it's no loss at all. You can even wrangle yourself an extra smite good per day by giving up your spell-like ability and fiendish sorcery class features. And that's just the start. Tiefling anti-paladins have so much to offer. Moving on, I think there's something to be said for Nagaji. They also get plus two to charisma, plus two to strength, and minus two to intelligence, and a plus one to natural armor from their armored scales trait. What evil aligned dragon would say no to a lizard man anti paladin in his service? Finally, definitely have a look at the Dampier. They have the feature negative energy affinity. This allows them to make very survivable tanks as anti paladins. Now that we've gone over race choices, Let's talk about your weapon and armor proficiencies. As an anti-paladin, you're proficient with all simple and martial weapons. Because this is a DPS class, 
I strongly recommend Great Axe, Great Sword, and Earthbreaker. You get the extra damage from wielding the weapon in two hands, and a lot of damage die. Your armor proficiencies are all armor. You can wear heavy, medium, and light armor, as well as having shields, except tower shields. However, I don't recommend using a shield for an anti-paladin. They are, on the whole, not nearly as tanky as their more righteous brethren. Focus on damage. Now, let's break down your class features. Starting with Aura of Evil. The power of your evil aura is equal to your anti-paladin level. This is for the purpose of the Detect Evil spell or ability. At level 1, your aura will be faint. At level 2 to 4, you'll have a moderate aura. From levels 5 to 10, you will have a strong aura. And 11 plus, you will have an overwhelming aura of evil surrounding you. Additionally, because you are so gosh darn evilly evil, a paladin using the Smite Evil ability on you will inflict two points of damage per paladin level on his first successful hit. The next class feature is Detect Good. At will, you can detect the presence of good-aligned creatures or items. As a move action, concentrate on a single item or creature within 60 feet to know if it's good, as well as the strength of its aura. Now, moving on to a class feature that sadly is not nearly as useful as its paladin equivalent. Smite good. As a swift action, choose one good creature you can see to smite. Add your charisma bonus to attack and your anti-paladin level to damage. If the target of your smite is a good-aligned dragon, outsider, or has levels in cleric or paladin, your first attack deals two points of damage per level. Your attacks bypass any DR the target may have. You also gain an AC bonus equal to your Charisma modifier against the target of your Smite. The Smite remains in effect until the target is dead or you rest. You may Smite one time per day at first, two times per day at fourth, three times per day at seventh, four times per day at tenth, five times per day at thirteenth, etc. Particularly in an evil campaign, it's likely that you'll be encountering good-aligned enemies. I would also say it's likely you'll be encountering your fair share of evil-aligned enemies, against which Smite Good has no utility whatsoever. The next class feature is Unholy Resistance. At second level, you add your Charisma bonus to saves. Also at second level, you get Touch of Corruption. A number of times per day, equal to one-half your anti-paladin level, plus your charisma modifier. As a touch attack, that's your strength modifier, plus your base attack bonus, you can inflict 1d6 points of damage per two anti-paladin levels. Alternatively, you can heal undead creatures for the same amount. This would include yourself if you have negative energy affinity. Any feats, spells, or items that affect Lay on Hands apply to Touch of Corruption. As an example, Extra Lay on Hands will give you two additional uses of Touch of Corruption. Now at third level, you get Aura of Cowardice. All creatures within 10 feet take a minus 4 penalty against fear effects. Creatures that would normally be immune to fear lose that ability when they are within 10 feet of you. Yes, that means you can intimidate zombies. Also, at third level, you get Plaguebringer. You take no penalties or damage from diseases, but you can still contract diseases and you can still spread them to others. Finally, at third level, you can add additional effects to your touch of corruption called Cruelties. When a target is affected by your touch of corruption, they must make a save, DC 10, plus half your anti-paladin level, plus your charisma modifier, or suffer the effect of a cruelty. You select what cruelty you would like to apply when the attack is made. At third level, you will be able to choose from the following cruelties. Fatigued. This inflicts a minus two to strength and dexterity. The target cannot run or charge. Shaken. This applies a minus two to attack, damage, saves, and ability checks. 
or sickened. This functions the same as shaken. Shaken and sickened last for one round per anti-paladin level. At 6th level, you gain access to additional cruelties. Daze. This lasts for one round per level. A dazed target can take no action, but has no penalty to AC. Diseased. This functions as the contagion spell. It allows you to inflict blinding sickness, bubonic plague, cackle fever, filth fever, leprosy, mind fire, red ache, shackles, or slimy doom. Staggered. Staggered lasts for one round per anti-paladin level. The target may make only a move or standard action, but not both. At level 9, you add additional cruelties to your arsenal, such as Cursed. This functions as bestow curse and can be truly nasty. You could apply a minus 6 penalty to one ability score. You could apply a minus 4 to attacks, saves, ability checks, and skills. Or impose a 50% chance to act normally per turn, or take no action. This effect is permanent. Then there's Exhausted. This requires the Fatigued Cruelty. The target takes a minus 6 to Strength and Dexterity, and cannot run or charge. The effect can only be removed by resting for one hour. Frightened. This lasts for one round per two Anti-Paladin levels, and requires the Shaken Cruelty. The target must flee and takes a minus two on attacks, saves, and skill checks. Then there's Nauseated. The target can't attack, cast spells, or do anything that requires an action. Only a single move action per turn. Finally, there's Poisoned. This functions as the Poison spell, inflicting 1d3 points of constitution damage per turn for six turns. A fort save ends this effect and negates the damage. Finally, at 12th level, your arsenal will expand yet again, adding blinded, deafened, paralyzed, and stunned cruelties to your arsenal. Once a cruelty has been selected, it cannot be changed. And remember, you can only apply one cruelty at a time to your target. Now, at 4th level, you get channel negative energy. This functions as the Cleric Channel Negative Energy ability. It creates a 30-foot radius burst, dealing 1d6 damage per odd level, or you could use it to heal undead. This ability consumes two uses of your Touch of Corruption. Also, at 4th level, you will receive Spells. You can cast a small number of Divine Spells from the Anti-Paladin Spell List. You must prepare what spells you want to cast ahead of time, at the start of the day, after resting. Now, here are a few spells I think you should consider. Spell level 1, Magic Weapon. This is good if you need a backup enchanted weapon. Another good level 1 spell are Dark Whispers. This allows you to speak to a target creature through the shadows. It's a good utility spell, great for talking to allies, and it's really thematic and spooky. The final level 1 spell I think you should consider is Line Breaker. This adds 20 feet to your charge and gives you a plus 2 bonus to bull rush and overrun combat maneuvers. At spell level 2, definitely consider Invisibility. You can live the Predator Dream and get up close and personal with your victims, which they'll be very surprised to see a big scary anti-paladin just materialize in front of them. Another good level 2 option is Widen Auras. You have some very powerful debuffing auras at your disposal, and it would be great to increase their size to 20 feet instead of 10. Finally, think about Litany of Defense. As a swift action, you can double your armor's enhancement bonus for one round. At level 3, a great option is Animate Dead. After all, why should necromantic clerics have all the fun? There's also Battle Trance. This gives you the Ferocity ability, which allows you to continue fighting even past negative HP. It also gives you temporary HP equal to 1d6 plus caster level up to 15. 
Finally, you get a plus four bonus to saves against mind effects. Finally, at third level, think about Vampiric Touch. This deals 1d6 damage, plus two additional damage per caster level. You gain temporary HP equal to the damage done using Vampiric Touch. Finally, level four. Greater Invisibility. You can attack even when invisible, and your enemies will have a significant mischance imposed on them. Also, Fear. This creates a 30-foot cone of terror in front of you. Creatures in the cone are forced to flee if they fail their save, and shaken if they succeed. This dovetails well with your aura of cowardice. Finally, at level 4, Profane Nimbus. Any good creature that strikes you with a natural attack or handheld weapon takes 1d6 plus 1 per caster level of damage. Also, you take half damage from good aligned spells. At level 5, you'll receive Fiendish Boon, and you'll have a choice to make. Your Fiendish Boon can take one of two forms. Number 1. Weapon Bond. This allows you to enhance a specific weapon chosen by you when you receive the boon as a standard action with a plus 1 enhancement bonus and an additional plus 1 for every three levels beyond 5th to a maximum of plus 6 at 20th level. You can use these enhancement bonuses to grant your weapon special qualities. For a plus 1 bonus, you could give your weapon Flaming, Keen, which doubles the crit rate, or Vicious, a deadly enhancement that deals 2d6 damage to the enemy and 1d6 damage to the wielder. For a plus 2 bonus... You could add Anarchic, Flaming Burst, Unholy, or Wounding to your weapon. For a plus 3 bonus, you can add Speed. Finally, for a plus 4 bonus, you can get a Vorpal weapon. You can use this ability one time per day at 5th level, and one additional time per day for every 4 levels thereafter. This effect lasts for 1 minute per Anti-Paladin level. Alternatively, your boon could be Fiendish Servant. This functions as Summon Monster 3, but the duration is permanent. You'll have your choice of Fiendish Servants. You could have a Dretch Demon, or any of the animals, such as an ape, a boar, or a dire bat, with the Fiendish template. Once the choice is made, it cannot be changed. However, you can choose again whenever you gain a level. Upon reaching 7th level, and every two levels thereafter, the level of the summon for your servant increases, allowing you for more exciting options, like Fiendish Direwolf, Fiendish Lion, Babu, Fiendish Dire Bear, Succubus, or perhaps the best of all, the Fiendish Tyrannosaurus. At 11th level, your servant gains the Advanced Template, and at 15th level, it gains spell resistance equal to your anti-paladin level, plus 11. Now, at 8th level, you'll get Aura of Despair. All enemies within 10 feet take a minus 2 penalty on all saves. This does not stack with Aura of Cowardice, however. The final anti-paladin class feature I'm going to talk about is Aura of Vengeance. At 11th level you can expend two uses of your Smite Good to grant the ability to all allies within 10 feet. They must use this ability before the start of your next turn, and the Smite Good effect lasts for one minute. Now that we've discussed your class features, let's talk about feats. First up, a staple feat, Power Attack. You take a minus one penalty on melee attack rolls, in exchange for a plus 2 bonus to damage. This damage bonus increases to plus 3 if you have a weapon held in both hands. When your base attack bonus reaches plus 4, the bonus damage increases by 2, and the penalty increases by minus 1. Let me give you an example. At level 4, with a strength modifier of 18 and a greatsword, you would have a plus 6 bonus to hit, but would do a whopping 2d6 
plus 10 points of damage. Another staple weapon feat I would recommend is Weapon Focus. This gives a plus 1 to hit bonus with your chosen weapon. You should also consider the combat maneuver feats, such as Improved and Greater Overrun. This allows you to attempt to move through enemy squares without provoking attacks of opportunity. You do this by making a combat maneuver check against any enemy that doesn't simply step aside and let you pass. If they try to stop you, you make a combat maneuver check. If you beat their combat maneuver defense, they're moved aside. And if you beat it by five or more, they're knocked prone. As an example, if you were seventh level with both feats and a strength score of 18, your combat maneuver bonus would be plus 15. Seven from your base attack bonus, four from your strength modifier, plus two from improved overrun, and plus two from greater overrun. Another great combat maneuver option is improved and greater sunder. To sunder, you make an attack designed to break armor, shields, or weapons. If an item has lost half its HP, it's less effective. Weapons take a negative two penalty on attack and damage, and armor and shields only provide half their AC bonus. If an item is reduced to zero HP, it's destroyed. Now let me give you an example. You are a level seven half-orc anti-paladin with both improved sunder and greater sunder and an 18 strength score, as well as the gatecrasher half-orc trait and an adamant greatsword. Your attack bonus would be plus 17. Seven from your BAB, four from your strength score, two from improved sunder, two from greater sunder, and two from the gatecrasher trait. Finally, your adamant sword would bypass any hardness less than 20. Hardness is essentially DR for items. Another feat for you to consider is Intimidating Prowess. You add your strength modifier to intimidate checks in addition to your charisma modifier. When combined with your auras, it will make it easy for you to demoralize your enemies. A demoralized enemy gains the shaken condition. You can attempt to demoralize enemies with an intimidate check as a standard action. Finally, consider the lay on hands feats, such as extra lay on hands for two additional uses of your touch of corruption or extra mercy to gain a new cruelty. Finally, I'd like to end with some inspiration for your anti-paladin. Starting off with a figure from Arthurian legend, Mordred. A lot of attention is given to Mordred's birth and upbringing. However, once he finally takes the field against Arthur, he's a terrifying foe, ready to die by impaling himself on Arthur's lance just to get the killing blow on the once and future king. Another great source of inspiration for anti-paladins comes from a galaxy far, far away with the Sith. Obviously, the classic is Darth Vader the Emperor's devastating right hand. But you can find a lot of very compelling Sith outside of the original trilogy, such as Darth Sion from Knights of the Old Republic 2. This Sith Lord is driven to spread pain across the galaxy. Or there's also Darth Bane, the Sith Lord that instituted the Rule of Two. Another character with powerful anti-paladin energy is the Kurgan from Highland. This guy is an absolute death machine with a tremendous kill count, beheading immortal after immortal through the centuries. You might also look at the Marauders from Doom Eternal. These are resurrected and corrupted Night Sentinels and the former companions of the Doom Slayer. Also, they have such cool axes. If you want a more tragic angle, you might consider Artorius the Abyss Walker from the Dark Souls game. His tragic tale shows that no one is stronger than the Abyss. Finally, definitely consider the Chaos Space Marines, particularly Huron Blackheart, and his demonic familiar, the Hamadrila. There's also Callus Typhon, who's all about that corruption and spreading disease. Finally, I have to mention the War Master himself, Abaddon the Despoiler, leader of the Black Legion and the biggest threat 
to the Imperium of Man. Well, if you don't count all the other biggest threats, such as, you know, Tyranids, the Silent King, and all of the other terrible things in the grimdark future. Thank you very much for watching this D6 Damage class analysis of the Anti-Paladin in Pathfinder 1E. If you're interested in more class analysis and strategy guides for Pathfinder 1E, check us out on BitChute and YouTube. And if you'd like to take your game further, join the D6 Damage Discord. We have fantastic discussions about strategy, role-playing, and more. The link is down in the description.